Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons To Go. I'm Mr. Dove and today we'll be looking at how DNA works. In order to understand how DNA works, we have to figure out how the information is encoded in the DNA double helix. When we look at our DNA, the code itself is going to be the specific order of those nucleotide bases. That order of A's, T's, C's, and G's is going to be the basis for the genetic code. What makes that DNA code different is the order of those bases and then how much of that DNA that an organism has. So an elm, an elk, and an eel all have DNA as the basis for their genetic code but they're going to have different amounts of DNA and the order of the DNA bases is going to be different so that trees have traits that are different from an elk and elks have traits that are different from an eel. Another way to think about it is a kind of like music. Um, there are only certain notes that can be made um, when producing music. But there are many different types of songs, rap music, country music, classical music. They're all using the same notes, but it's the order of those notes that they're different, which allow them to have a very unique sound, even though they're based on the same code for music. So what we're going to look at, we're going to step through the process that it takes for us to go from our gene to our physical trait, like, say, for instance, rolling our tongue. Two scientists by the name of George Beadle and Edward Tatum, um, they were the first to really begin the process of understanding the relationship between genes and our, our traits. They were working with a bread mold called Neurospora crassa. What they did is they exposed mold to x-rays and ultraviolet radiation in order to um, mutate the DNA on the inside. They found that certain strains of this bread mold had a mutation which made it very difficult for them to survive if we didn't supplement their food with some extra vitamins, some extra amino acids. The, when they looked at the DNA of the mutants versus the normal, they differed by only a single gene. So normally, um, Neurospora, the wild Neurospora, um, they can have a minimum amount of food and they're able to grow and be happy. So we've got some happy bread mold here. Whereas our mutant Neurospora, if you give them the minimal growth medium, they can't survive. They don't actually grow at all. Whereas we have to give them a supplement. We have to give them that additional vitamin, that additional amino acid, and then they're able to grow. So because they're missing that one gene, they're unable to survive on minimal growth medium. So Beetle and Tatum, they uh, formulated then what we call the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis which states that each individual gene's purpose, its function, is to dictate the production of a specific enzyme. In other words, a gene is responsible for the production of a particular protein, or in this case, a particular enzyme. And so what we've done is we've kind of confirmed this and then we include all types of proteins. So genes code for proteins. Our genotype is going to code for our phenotype. Now the process of going from DNA to protein, uh, from DNA to our physical trait, um, is a process called protein synthesis. Protein synthesis we're going to try to simplify things as much as possible here um, and look at it in terms of two steps, transcription and then translation. Now DNA is stored inside the nucleus 
Um, the only time that the DNA leaves the nucleus is when the nucleus breaks down during uh, cell division. DNA is a relatively large molecule, and the DNA is a double helix, which means that it's much too large to leave through the nuclear pores. So DNA can't go in and out of the nucleus in order to be expressed. So we need something that can go into the nucleus, get that DNA message, and then take it to the ribosomes where proteins can be made. So to help out, we have a molecule called RNA, ribonucleic acid. You might think of it as sort of like the little brother of DNA. And it's the RNA which is responsible for helping um, in the manufacture of proteins. So kind of think of you know DNA as uh, a large um, boss who always sits behind his desks. He doesn't want to leave his desk, um, but he's got all the instructions. He is the DNA. Um, and the desk is kind of like the nucleus, and so RNA is the helper, and he helps the boss um, take care of business. He's going to be responsible for helping in the production of making proteins. Now, if we were to compare RNA to DNA side by side, just from the picture, you can already notice that there's something different. Um, DNA is a double helix, whereas you notice here that RNA is only a single helix. The DNA has the sugar deoxyribose, and RNA is going to have the sugar ribose, hence the difference in names. RNA has a lot of similar bases to DNA with one exception. It has adenine, but there is no thymine. There's only uracil. And then we have cytosine and guanine. So here in our picture, you can see uracil is switched for thymine. Now when RNA and DNA pair up, because in order for um, RNA to work in conjunction with DNA, they do have to match up at times. Um, they match up just the same, um, with that one exception. When you have RNA, there's going to be a uracil in place. So in, in DNA, if we have an A, it'll go with a U. If in DNA you have a T, you still go with an A. And then the G's and the C's, there's no change there. So the first step of protein synthesis is called transcription. During transcription, the DNA is going to be copied as messenger RNA inside the nucleus. So the first thing is going to happen, just like if we were going to replicate the DNA, the DNA unzips. So helicase comes into play once again. Now the DNA is going to serve as a template for a special kind of RNA called messenger RNA or mRNA. The messenger RNA is going to uh, pair with the, str the coding strand of DNA um, inside of the nucleus. Um, the enzyme RNA polymerase is going to be doing this, to facilitating the addition of those new RNA polymers, hence the name polymerase. Here's the key uh, point that we have to remember. DNA is anti-parallel, and because DNA is anti-parallel, only one strand is actually being copied down. So we call that the coding strand or the sense strand. Now once DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, um, it has to be processed. Um, there's different things that are going to be happening. For example, um, there are non-coding portions of the DNA, basically DNA junk that has to be excised um, before it can uh, be used in the next step of protein synthesis. Um, so there's a lot of additional components um, that we will uh, leave for another time. So once the, the RNA has been processed, it's going to leave the nucleus and it's going to go to the cytoplasm, it's going to go to the ribosomes so that it can be produced um, into proteins through the process of translation. During translation, the messenger RNA is going to be read. And it's read by uh, 
that's read at the ribosome, because that's the site of protein synthesis, by a special kind of RNA called tRNA, or transfer RNA, or sometimes it's referred to as translating RNA. Now the tRNA, what it's doing is it's carrying a specific amino acid. Remember, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So the tRNA is basically carrying the building blocks to the messenger RNA so that we can assemble them in the correct order. To make sure that it is um, going to be assembled in an appropriate order, what's going to happen is we're going to match up um, with on our mRNA um, to what's, what's called a codon. Um, every three mRNA bases is a codon. And on the tRNA, we've got a triplet that's complementary to our codon. And that triplet is called an anticodon. And they're going to match up. And so the sequence of uh, bases that's on the mRNA that was dictated by the sequence of bases on the DNA is going to then dictate which uh, tRNAs go in place and which amino acid is then linked up to produce our protein. So each codon, a codon being um, a triplet of bases, reading in groups of three, um, is going to build for the 20 amino acids. It's going to code for the 20 amino acids. Now there are some special codons, uh, four of them, that either code for starting the production of the protein, or it actually codes for stopping the production of the protein. So you might be wondering, well, why in the world are we reading them in groups of three? Well, we only have four bases for DNA. And remember, scientists thought that that was way too simple to be able to code for all of our characteristics. But if they're read in groups of three, that's the right combination to be able to produce all of the amino acids that then go together to produce all of the proteins for every living thing on planet Earth. If they were read individually, certainly it would be too simple. You would only get four combinations. If they were read in pairs, we have a lot of combinations, but not enough to equal the 20 amino acids that exist. But if you read them in groups of three, there's more than enough um, combinations. And if we look at this, if we look at the chart here, it shows us how each of those combinations are coding for the various amino acids. Um, an interesting thing that will uh, become important as we move forward is this redundancy um, is kind of a positive thing in terms of uh, being able to produce our proteins. So there's more than four different ways to produce the amino acid leucine. In fact, here's two more. Um, so we've got lots of different ways to produce the amino acids that we need. Now, the final protein will be formed as that amino acid sequence begins to fold into pleated sheets or twist into alpha helices and then bond with other uh, amino acid chains to produce that final three-dimensional protein, that final quaternary protein structure, which then gives us our, our particular trait um, that we're looking for, our particular enzyme. So before we finish up, um, let's work a little practice here. So here we've got um, a short DNA sequence. Uh, we know that it's d -d DNA because it has thymine. DNA uh, obviously would be a double helix, so this is only the coding strand that we're interested in for producing our particular trait. The first step in protein synthesis is going to be transcription. We're going to copy that DNA message as messenger RNA. So messenger RNA is going to match with its complement. So T will go with A. A will go with U, because remember we're going to messenger RNA, C with G, G with C, C with G, T with A, A with U, 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 then U, A, A. 
So this is going to be our messenger RNA. And it has the copy, it's the complementary copy of our DNA single helix. Now that's going to leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome because that's where we need to produce our proteins. The tRNA is going to bring in specific amino acids. Um, it's going to uh, match with its complement on the mRNA to assemble those amino acids in the correct order. So um, to read this uh, codon chart, you find your first letter. So we're looking for A, so that tells us that we're in this particular row. Then we find our second letter, so we're looking for U, which tells us we're in this column. And then lastly, we find our final letter, which tells us where we are in this box. And so the first um, amino acid is methanionine. Methanionine is the first amino acid for every protein on planet Earth. Um, we call this our start codon because that starts the message. Our next amino acid will be uh, coming from C, G, A, and that would be arginine. And then we have U, 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 which is phenylalanine. And then lastly, we have U, A, G, or U, A, A. Um, wouldn't matter either way because that is our stop codon, kind of like the period to our sentence. So we have our start to our message and our stop to our message, and this little dipeptide is the beginnings of a particular protein. Protein synthesis is a compl complicated process, um, a lot of practice, um, and you will master this topic.